65 degrees at the start of the night here on Sunday October 21st beautiful day here in Boston and for the Cleveland lineup we give you their rookie right handed reliever Jensen Lewis this is Jensen Lewis reliever of the Cleveland Indians with your starting lineup for game seven leading off Superman and center Grady Sizemore hitting second to whiz kid and as Cabrera hitting third prompt Travis Hafner batting fourth our catcher and our RBI baseball champion Victor Martinez batting fifth playing first is Ryan Garko batting six Johnny Peralta playing shortstop batting seventh is Kenny Lofton the Angels wonder in left field batting eight is Franklin Gutierrez playing right batting ninth is Casey Blake playing third base and our starting pitcher tonight is Jake the Snake Westbrook. Attaway Jensen he grew up wanting to be a play by play announcer. He could definitely do what I do. I know I couldn't do what he does right now. It's time for the Budweiser opening pitch reach for the perfect balance of flavor and refreshment Budweiser the great American lager. Kevin Millar had a huge ovation here at Fenway Park as he was introduced to go out and throw out the ceremonial first pitch. And Kevin Millar the former Boston Red Sox first baseman D.H. gives you the Boston lineup tonight. And your starting lineup for your 2007 Boston Red Sox. Batting first and playing second base, D. Dustin Pedroia, whom I'm lending my number, number 15. Batting second, playing first base, Kevin Euclid. Batting third, known as the Big Poppy and DH. Batting fourth, Manny being Manny Ramirez in left field. And batting fifth, Michael Lowell, the biggest eyebrows in baseball. Batting six with a big grand slam last night in game six, J.D. Drew and playing right field. Batting seventh, Jason, the captain, Veritek, Johnny Nice, the only guy to wear a flat top in 2007. Batting eighth and playing center field, Jacob Ellsbury. And batting ninth, playing shortstop, Julio Lugo from Tampa Bay to Boston. And doing the pitching night for the Boston Red Sox, known as Dice K, Daniel Matsuzaka. All right, thank you, Kevin Millar. And there are the starting lineups for this game seven. There are the eyebrows, and there's your right-hander, Dice K. Matsuzaka, a 15-game winner during the regular season. So far, 0-1 this postseason. He took the loss in the 4-2 win by Cleveland in Game 3. to Grady Sizemore Jensen Lewis saying Grady Sizemore was Superman he's been without his cape the last four games only two for 14 over the last four games against Boston a shattered bat and a pop up for Pedroia and Superman just broke his back he can do that the scouting report on Dice K. Matsuzaka. I think the uh, the obvious logical question: How long can he effectively last? As you mentioned in the opening, Joe, this is not a normal game. At any sign of trouble, someone will get up in the bullpen. Different pitches from different angles. Terry Francona telling us before the game: Typically, you say to a pitcher, simplify things. But they really want Dice K to make things more complicated because of all of the weapons he has and not just rely on the fastball and the cutter. Yeah, don't limit yourself to two pitches. Use all six of them. An impressive rookie as Drupal Cabrera, the number two man in the lineup for Eric Wedge. Schilling on the left, the winner last night. Beckett on the right is available to pitch tonight on two days rest. Foul tip, strike two. In Japan, it's legendary. It's the gyro ball. All it is is a glorified screwball.
ninety five mile an hour fastball fouled back by Cabrera. Fifty one million dollars from the Red Sox to Cebu his team in Japan just to talk. A fifty two million dollar deal later and a one hundred three million dollar investment to put Matsuzaka in a Red Sox uniform and here he is in game seven. Up the middle Pedroia on two hops two out. The MasterCard key to the game, Game 7. We understand this is an oversimplification, but the team that breathes the easiest wins. And when you look at the experience factor between these two teams, you've got the core players for Boston. They have been here in this situation before. Guys like David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez and Jason Veritek from the 2004 season coming back off the mat to jump up and surprise the Yankees and make history. Meanwhile for Cleveland they are hoping that their DH can center a ball and give the Indians a jolt. Ball one. Ninety six from Matsuzaka. But the experience thing is only as good as in this case Matsuzaka on the mound and if somebody's going to do something heroic out of the lineup for the Indians tonight. Breaking ball for strike one. ALCS game one. One of just three hits in this ALCS for Hafner. His only home run. He has only two RBIs. This is a pitch that has given him fits. The fastball. Normally a fastball hitter, but the Red Sox pitchers have been just blowing it by. Prompt. Two nations hanging on every pitch from Daisuke Matsuzaka. Red Sox Nation and Japan. 13 hours ahead. Monday morning rush hour in Tokyo. 9.30 a.m. 2-2 Two -two pitch. Full count with Victor Martinez. The switch hitting catcher on deck. So much was made of Daisuke after that game three loss staring into his locker for an hour after the game. Terry Francona didn't mind it. Thought he was trying to separate himself from that game and when he walked out of the ballpark that night it was over. He's retired the first two. Hafner a weak swing and a pitch up and away. Brady Sizemore since game two two for 15 and overall this postseason 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position and Hafner with nine strikeouts in his last 15 at bats and he's looking for his first hit in a while. HD and under the bright lights it's the right hander Jake Westbrook who was so good in game three back in Cleveland he got the win and almost got through seven full six shutout innings before Jason Veritek hit a two run homer in the seventh inning and speaking of seven this is game seven no room for error if there is a mini rally you're gone and pitchers understand that again Sabathia is in the bullpen for the Indians Josh Beckett is in the bullpen for the Red Sox Dustin Pedroia leads it off for Boston and Sabathia is already out there Beckett's in the dugout. 
Gets the outside corner in strike one to Pedroia. Home plate umpire is Randy Marsh. And Westbrook in this series now has thrown a first pitch strike to 22 of 28 batters faced. 0 and 2 on Pedroia. First pitch strike to the first 11 in game three for the 30 year old right hander Westbrook. And because of those first pitch strikes, it doesn't allow these Red Sox hitters to be as patient and get into hitters' counts as they have against the big two for Cleveland. That's into left field base hit. That's not a mistake as far as pitches is concerned, but the location. Too much of the plate. Pedroia goes down to get it. That looked like a changeup, which is an odd pitch to throw on an 0-2 count. Breaking ball away, fastball away, but a changeup? Odd. Here's Euclid. Look at those numbers. Overall in the postseason, a 400 average, 478 in this series. Hitting in front of Ortiz. Ball one. Call that a changeup. Sometimes when a fastball pitcher grips a ball too tightly, he throws it slower. We've talked about it time and time again. The tighter the pitcher holds the ball, the slower the pitch is. Two and all on Euclid. Euclid was hit by a pitch against the Yankees on the 15th of September, missed seven games. An injured wrist has been slowly but surely working his swing back into order and by his own description a handsy hitter. He's been hot. Three and oh. down the middle three balls and a strike for Euclid who hit only 238 after the All-Star game overall hit 288 83 RBIs 16 home runs and he's gone deep twice in this series great spot in which to hit you know you're going to get the fastball you have to make sure it's a strike left side base hit Season numbers for Ortiz are in the category of legendary. Last nine postseason elimination games, a 333 average, five homers, 16 RBI. And already in this first inning tonight, top two guys doing what they did all night last night. Seven times Pedroya and Euclid were aboard. What makes Ortiz so, so difficult for a sinker ball pitcher? A sinker baller has to keep the ball down to be effective in double play situations. And Ortiz is such a good low ball hitter that he takes out the left center field here with the green monster. Down the line with foul. And that's the stroke that's dangerous in this ballpark. Mo Vaughn made a lot of money with that stroke here at Fenway Park. Green Monster is not far away, 37 feet tall. And Ortiz can play pepper against it. that pitch from Westbrook getting Ortiz off the plate. Yeah you got to move his feet in order to keep that sinker effective. That's where pitchers try to pitch Ortiz but sinker ballers can't pitch a guy like Ortiz inside because the ball straightens out inside. Back in there and a swinging strike it's one and two. Two good biting 
sliders into Ortiz. Second inning against Westbrook back in Cleveland. The Red Sox loaded the bases with nobody out. Didn't score. Often went deep in the bottom of the second, and the Indians won it 4 2. 2 and 2. A 4.32 career average for Ortiz in the postseason with runners in scoring position. And a big strikeout for Jake Westbrook. He went right back in there and rings up David Ortiz. After that first foul ball on the sinker, watch the pitches from Westbrook. Inside. Outside. Fighting inside. And he got Ortiz on that slider inside. A little cut fastball or slider. Three excellent pitches to get Ortiz. Now Manny Ramirez with two on and one out. Hitting 421 in this LCS. Two homers, nine RBIs. Strike one on Manny Ramirez. If you're wondering who is Jake Westbrook, 30 year old, 6'3, 200 pounder from Danielsville, Georgia. Picked up by the Indians from the Yankees, along with Ricky Lede and Zach Day for David Justice back in 2000. 96 97 was in the Colorado system and spent weeks on the disabled list this year from May 7th to June 4th with a strained abdomen. It has been getting better as the season has worn on. Strike two on Ramirez. First 12 starts for Westbrook this season. He was one and six. Last 15 starts, he's six and four, but a good ERA of 3.29. Another 0 2 count for Ramirez. He's at 400. With two home runs and five walks. Totally unaffected with two strikes. Victor Martinez set up way out there, ball one. The reason we talk about staying ahead one major league hitter this year hit over 300 with two strikes on him. One. And that was Placido Polanco of the Detroit Tigers. And he had 350 with two strikes. And he was the only one. So you get two strikes on hitters, the advantage certainly goes to the pitcher. Hard hit, bad hop, pass Peralta. Here comes Pedroia. And the Red Sox strike first. May have hit the lip. I think it hit the lip. We saw a ball hit the lip in last night's game and stay down. This ball hit the lip of the infield grass and went up right there. A bad hop to Peralta. Good base running by Pedroia. Great jump from second. A lot of times that runner at second has to freeze with the line drive. Pedroia with a good jump to score the first run. Watch that ball go up when it hits. Bang. It was a tailor-made double play ball. And the Red Sox watch it take a hop. It's an RBI single for Manny Ramirez. Shoot over the head of Johnny Peralta. Boston leads one to nothing. Lowell now batting with two on. Only one out. Ball one. Last night it was Grady Sizemore who led off in game six and hit a ball down the right field line. Some thought it was a home run. It was not ruled a home run, ruled a foul ball. He eventually grounded out. And then the Red Sox went to work and they got the grand slam from Drew. The two out in the bottom of the first. 
One ball one strike as Westbrook gets that outside pitch. And yet another two strike hit by Manny Ramirez. Ball two last night it was Kevin Euclid up. See how that ball stayed down Euclid with an infield hit and tonight the ball for hit by Manny Ramirez goes up and over the head of Peralta and the Red Sox score first two one to Lowell three balls and a strike. And Drew could bat with the bases loaded again in the first inning. Or Westbrook has to challenge Lowell who led the Red Sox in RBIs with one hundred twenty. Line drive, base hit, left field. Euclid will be held as Kenny Lofton gets it back in a hurry, and the bases are loaded for Drew. Ball hit too hard here at Fenway Park. Lofton does not have a strong throwing arm in left field. But here at Fenway, a ball hit that sharply. No way to try to score the runner. And now, with Carl Willis coming out, you wonder how long it's going to be for Cleveland to get somebody up in the bullpen. Well, if you want to just paint it in broad strokes, the difference between tonight and game three for Westbrook is the first pitch. First 11 hitters in game three, the first pitch was strike one, and it has been hit or miss so far tonight. He fell behind Lowell. Lowell got him for a base hit. He fell behind Euclid. Euclid got him for a base hit. He's given up two two strike hits, one to Ramirez and one to Pedroia. Last night, first inning, 3 1 pitch, two out, bases loaded. Drew became an instant hero. Seems to me Cleveland's got to get somebody up right now. If it's CC Sabathia, he's a starter and he takes longer to warm up than a reliever. Drew. That hit the mound. Peralta out at second and out at first. A bare hand grab in the middle during that double play and a big twin killing turn behind Westbrook. One to nothing Boston after one. Talked about Placido Polanco in the last half inning he would get my vote as the best defensive second baseman in the American League didn't commit an error all year but as far as making the sparkling play and the athletic play at the second base position I haven't seen anybody better than as Drupal Cabrera and it paid off and avoided at least one more run who knows how many turning that double play to end the bottom of the first that was a sensational turn of a double play because if he uses his glove if the glove comes into contact it's not a double play Drew beats the play at first base it had to be barehanded very awkwardly barehanded and a strong throw to first to get Drew Victor Martinez took a ball now a strike and here's the play little shovel from Peralta barehanded to get Drew. You can see if that glove's involved, no chance to get the guy at first. That's and a little big wink. time right I there. Mean, that, boy. That's like, that's Vizquel esque. Yes, sir. From the other side of the bag. Mm. Here's a 1 1 pitch to Victor Martinez out in front of it. The tap foul, it's 1 and 2. It's Martinez, Garco, and Johnny Peralta. Anybody gets on the number seven man Kenny Lofton Matsuzaka had a perfect first inning. One to nothing Boston on the RBI base hit by Manny Ramirez. Served at third base and caught by Lowell, one out. 
Talk about a hitter. Victor Martinez spraying line drives all over the ballpark after failing to get a ball out of the infield in game one. He can hit line drive right at Lowell. Here's Ryan Garko. Meanwhile, when you think about Matsuzaka, he won seven of his first nine decisions. But from the 15th of August, his record two and five, including the postseason, and his ERA is over seven. But Tim, it's not that he doesn't have the great stuff. I think his approach is something that he's been talked to about with from Kurt Schilling, from John Farrell, his pitching coach, from Terry Francona. It has been a long first year here in the States for Dice K. Matsuzaka. The 0 1. Nasty breaking ball 0 2. Way outside, and Garko went. I mean, you can imagine the, the cultural problem alone of coming from Japan, but of course, the Japanese players know that. And Terry Francona firmly believes that he'll be okay next year with a year under his belt. Weekly hit left side and a chance for Lowell. Two out. Matsuzaka in Japan for Cebu, eight years, 108 and 60 was his record, an ERA of 2.95. But realize it's only a six team league. So he only has five opponents within his league that he's pitching against. You don't have the travel, obviously, Japan that you have here. And he pitched with an extra day's rest compared to the five man rotation and what they ask of starting pitchers here in the big leagues in the States. Peralta rounds out. Lowell took care of all three and a good start from Matsuzaka doing his part. Bottom of the second at Fenway Park. One to nothing Boston. Couldn't have a prettier night. Mid 60s. Crystal clear blue sky all day here in Boston and between innings Josh Beckett has now left the dugout and he is seated out in the bullpen for Boston. Veritek hits one into left off the top of the monster and Veritek is going to cruise into second base with a double. I think somebody's got to get up right now in the Cleveland bull, bullpen. Five hits for Westbrook off of Westbrook in one plus inning. And once again, CC Sabathia being a starter, if you're going to bring him in, he's going to take longer to warm up to me. You cannot wait too long in this game. Here's Jacoby Ellsbury. Last night, Jacoby had a hit. Was one for five with an RBI run scored. Hey. Showing bunt. Watching Jacoby Ellsbury before the game, bunting, they lay a hat down along the third baseline where DeMarlo Hale, the third base coach, is walking down to give the signs. And Ellsbury tries to bunt it into the hat. And he did it two times during one round of swings he is a very good punter. I don't think this is the time to bunt. you give up and out he showed it now he doesn't show it and he takes the ball up and away one and one maybe to get the infield moving around it looked like Terry Francona said swing the bat you've got Julio Lugo on deck if you had somebody else on deck then the bunt would be in order but not now well, it has at least done its job of bringing the infield in on the corners Garko in at first and Blake in at third that's on the corner and that's strike two. And now those two infielders will back up. One ball two strikes on Ellsbury and as Tim said Julio Lugo waits on deck. And a little flare for a base hit. A two strike hit. The third of the game against Westbrook already. Ellsbury driving in his first postseason run last night. 
with a little flare to left field. And now a key hit just getting by Peralta. Veritek had to hold up and can only go to third. And I know where you're looking more than you're looking down on the playing field right now. You're right. Out in the bullpen. And there is no action for the Indians. As Julio Lugo steps in first and third. Nobody out. I mean you don't want the game to be out of hand when you make your first move. Lugo strike one. It's something that we talked about with the managers prior to the game and walking that fine line of letting a starter settle into the game. But because this is game seven and if the game gets away from you the season is over you also have to be at least prepared to make a change when the time comes. Westbrook battled out of big trouble in the first and now he checks on Ellsbury. Jacoby was dying for nine in the stolen base department in case you're wondering during the regular season and he is one for one in the postseason. Lugo last night with a two run double. Step to third, look to first move, and Ellsbury was barely off the bag. So the speed of Jacoby Ellsbury, the rookie at first, is at least on the mind of Jake Westbrook and the Indians bench. Round ball, double play ball to short, out at second, out at first, a run scores, it's 2-0. But Westbrook gets another double play behind him. And that is now 19 double plays that the Red Sox have hit into this postseason. 13 in this LCS. Yeah, that's the eighth double play turned by Westbrook. He has led the majors in double play ground balls the last four years. So no RBI for Lugo. He plates the run. It's 2-0 in Pedroia. Steps in with a base is empty two away. He singled and scored his first time. Ball one. Terry Francona has stayed with Pedroia. Eric Wedge the Indians manager has stayed with his lineup despite some of the struggles. That's a little fly ball in the left for Kenny Lofton. A run in the first for Boston and a run in the second. Two double plays turned behind Westbrook, who has been able to limit the damage. A leadoff double by Veritek got it started. Ellsbury helped out. Lugo plated the run. Two to nothing after two in game seven. Top of the third inning already six hits for Boston, but just two runs because of the good sinker ball of Jake Westbrook and the two double plays turned behind him. Kenny Lofton first up. And that one gets away from Matsuzaka. Lofton took Matsuzaka deep in game three, a two run shot. Cleveland looking for its first base runner tonight. And after a fast start in this ALCS, Lofton has cooled off. Lofton didn't like the call. It's on the outside corner, one and one. Lofton thought it was outside. It was close. Notice how Veritek just holds the glove when he catches the ball. Modern term is framing. He does it well. Strike two. Tonight's AT&T trivia question. A good one. Can you name the three Hall of Famers that played in the last game seven at Fenway Park? which was the 86 ALCS against the Angels. One two pitch to Kenny Lofton. Out of play. What a dramatic series that was. 
at game five one of the classic games in postseason history against the Angels and the Red Sox one in extra innings on a Dave Henderson home run off Donnie Moore. Two and two. Nobody in the history of baseball has ever jumped higher and twirled in the air than Henderson after hitting that home run. Yeah. On his way to first. And while all that was going on, game six between the Mets and the Houston Astros were going on in Houston. A 16 inning affair won by the Mets, and they won the National League pennant. The 2 2 pitch, Lofton takes ball three. Hits one in the air to right. Easy for J.D. Drew. Seven up, seven down against Matsuzaka. Boys and Girls Clubs of America is the official charity of Major League Baseball. Together, they create a positive place for kids. Here is Franklin Gutierrez, and his manager, Eric Wedge, has shown an awful lot of faith in this 24-year-old outfielder. Last night, Eric Wedge gave the start to Trot Nixon, who was two for three with two singles. A line drive into right caught for an out. And Trot Nixon is a 333 career hitter during the postseason here at Fenway. Strike one. Yeah, I think that's the first questionable move that's from a lineup standpoint and the insertion of a starter from either manager in this series. Now, had Nixon gone 0 for 3 yesterday, it's no question Gutierrez with much better defensive player he's in there. But a lot of raised eyebrows since Franklin was starting after Trot Nixon, who was with the Red Sox for almost a thousand games, had two hits last night. There's numbers in this series and overall in the postseason hitting 455, the 1 1 pitch. Strike two. But Eric Wedge will tell you Gutierrez is our right fielder. He said that we in this series have not seen how good he can be. He's very good defensively and is a center field type player playing right. Well, if you're Matsusaka right here, you go out of the strike zone to try to get Gutierrez. Off the plate away. Play on the fact that he is a young hitter. Gutierrez doesn't go after it. Two and two. Fish ain't biting. <laughs> Gutierrez has struck out six times in this series and is just two out of 15. All four of his RBIs and his home run came in game number two here at Fenway. Full count as it was with Lofton. On deck is Casey Blake. For it pops it up. Pedroia for out number two, and that's eight straight retired by Daisuke here at the start. Let's go down to Chris Myers. And Joe Terry Francona's message to Daisuke for this game was pound the strike zone. 16 of his first 21 pitches were for strikes. And as far as communication goes, it's good. John Farrell, pitching coach, said while Daisuke was taking English lessons this year, he was taking Japanese lessons. It's more a cultural difference through an interpreter. Daisuke said after game three, he wanted to atone. That was the word he used. And his teammates say, no matter what his facial expression is, he's one of the fiercest competitors they've ever seen. And that comes through no matter what culture you're in. Thank you, Chris. He's 27 years old, Dice K, as Casey Blake shows bunt takes a strike. 
But it's not some kid who's on the big stage for the first time. He was the MVP of the World Baseball Classic two springs ago. It was 3-0. ERA of 1.38. Beat Cuba to win it for Japan. That's over but low. 1-1. One one. He was 1-1, one one, Dice K was, with a 1.69 ERA in the 2004 Olympics in Athens. 2.33 ERA in the 2000 Olympics in Sydney. And when the Major League Baseball players went over to Japan, Daisuke faced him and he threw a five hit complete game effort for the victory in a five to one win. You also talked about him in high school. He went to Yokohama High School, where in a quarterfinal game of the Koshian National High School Tournament, he struck out or threw 250 pitches in 17 innings and then got a save the next day. Blake base hit and the Indians have their first base runner of the night and now Grady Sizemore will have a chance to come up with something for Cleveland as Casey Blake becomes the first base runner of the night for the Indians. That was a breaking ball that didn't break just hanging in the middle of the plate and the Indians have their first base runner. Can you imagine that though a high school senior throwing 250 pitches and then coming back the next day and getting a save. <laughs> and then the day after that through a complete game in the winter. Yeah right. <laughs> Brady Sizemore 0 for 1 he popped up his first time. <laughs> On the inside corner Sizemore didn't like the call for the Indians have got a guy at the plate who hit 24 home runs during the regular season. He's hit two in the postseason. Started this night though hitting only 208 in the ALCS now five out of 25. So down to 200. Oh. Baratek keeps it in front of him but Blake he's done that two times in this series. Showing he's a good base runner and on his toes that pitch hit the dirt and he was off. That is terrific base running. Ball in the dirt in front of home plate a little inside to Veritech. Nice job of blocking it but you've got to run if you're on first base immediately and that's what Blake does. So now base hit cuts the lead in half it's two to nothing here in the top of the third. But again 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position this postseason for Grady Sizemore. One of the best young players in the game. Strike two. from Matsuzaka so the count remains one and two and Matsuzaka just went ahead and threw it anyway. Matsuzaka very deliberate out there and he had taken too much time and Grady Sizemore stepping out. You want to make sure the umpire hurt you particularly with two strikes. Indians desperately need a hit from Grady Sizemore. Suzaka started to walk off. It's ball two. Well, Sizemore thought the first pitch was low, and Matsusaka thought this pitch was not too high, but it appeared to be. So a 2 2 count. Decent swing by Sizemore at a 93 mile per hour pitch. That was a shot of Okajima. 
out in the bullpen and Terry Francona said that even in the early innings if there is a jam Okajima could be the one called upon out of the bullpen typically he's a seventh eighth even a ninth inning guy yeah he has not come into a game prior to the sixth inning this year in fact he's only come into the sixth inning once to start the inning and Sizemore get the big hit with two out Two strikeouts for Daisuke. First runner and first runner stranded by the Indians. Euclid, Ortiz, Ramirez coming up for the Red Sox who lead by two. First pitch rides up and into Kevin Euclid and we start the bottom of the third inning. Euclid, Ortiz and Ramirez. Two to nothing Boston. RBIs by Manny Ramirez. The other scored on a double play ball for that of Lugo. Another rocket hit by Euclid. They'll have at least two. Kenny Lofton digs it out. Another leadoff double. How about seven hits against Jake Westbrook already? There have been 11 Red Sox hitters up thus far. Every ball has been hit to the left side of second base. Not one ball to the right of second. We said it in the first, we said it in the second, and we'll say it in the third. The bullpen should be up, and finally, Jensen Lewis is up and throwing. So Lewis gets loose. And here is David Ortiz who struck out his first time with runners on at first and second. By the way Kevin Euclid is now hitting 520 in this ALCS and for a guy who was around on the team but not on the active roster in 2004. He's making the most of this chance here in 07. Two and oh on Ortiz. Inside corner, two and one. Good pitch from Westbrook, and that's the area where Westbrook got Ortiz back in the first. Yeah, he's made his best pitches against the, the most dangerous hitter, arguably, in the Red Sox lineup. Ortiz or Ramirez, take your pick. He has threaded the needle with four pitches on the inside corner. Back inside, Ortiz was ready for it, and he wheeled on it. Foul, two and two. They have some new members down in the drum corps and the bullpen for the Red Sox. I wonder if Beckett's in on that. I'm not sure they allow starters into that group. <laughs> two and two, the count on Ortiz, who gets time at the plate. Mariano Rivera the great Yankee stopper said this about David Ortiz that he used to have holes but he's filled them up. You used to could come inside on him not anymore. Unless you just bury the ball inside. To the right side going to third is Euclid one out. So Ortiz advances the runner and Manny Ramirez is coming up. Our AT&T trivia question was can you name the three Hall of Famers who played in the last game seven at Fenway Park. The 86 ALCS Wade Boggs and then two Angels Reggie Jackson and Don Sutton. Here comes an intentional pass. Two reasons. Obviously, you've got 
one of the most dangerous hitters in the game and Manny Ramirez at the plate. And a double play candidate in Mike Lowell on deck and that's what Westbrook has featured. Two double plays turned behind him in the first two innings. One thing you hate to do you hate to walk hitters regardless of how dangerous they are in the early innings when you're behind as the Indians are. But really Eric Wedge has no choice right here. So we talked about this. That's what we talked about the rules that typically apply during the regular season are broken right in a game seven. Yep. And Wedge just broke one with Lowell coming up. It's only the third inning and Lowell's a guy who can burn you with a hundred twenty RBIs in the regular season and was seventh best in average at three twenty four. Jensen Lewis has got to be ready in the bullpen for the Indians so that option is there for Eric Wedge if and when he needs it. Ball one to Lowell. Lowell singled his first time. A run producer is the Red Sox third baseman. Low 2 0. Oh. JD Drew on deck. Will tag Gutierrez with the catch. Euclid to the plate to make it 3 0. Red Sox have scored a run on a double play and now on a sack fly. You could see that expression on Westbrook's face like oh no not another run. Minute Lowell hit that ball Westbrook appeared to know that it was deep enough to plate the run. Now Drew bounced into a double play his first time and Lowell not trying to pull that pitch just serving it into right field a pitch that was up and away and he made the RBI look awfully easy here in the third inning taking what Westbrook gave him. There's a strike to Drew. It's one and one. Picket fence going. One, one, one. Drew with five RBIs last night. Up on the count here, two and one. The Indians are trying to become the first team since the 1992 Atlanta Braves to go from up three games to one lose games five and six and then come back and win game seven. That was the Sid Bream score on the hit by Cabrera. The pitcher who won game six by the way of the 1992 National League Championship Series. Tim Wakefield. Here's a 3 1. Drew in the air to left. Loft and drifting. And there to make the catch. Kevin Euclid, a big part of it again tonight. Singled in the first inning. And doubled here in the third. Scored on the sack fly by Lowell. 3 0 Boston after three. Two, three, and four hitters for the Indians. And first pitch swinging is as Drupal Cabrera. Julio Lugo hauls in out number one. We talked to John Farrell, the pitching coach of the Red Sox, comparing what he sees tonight to what he saw in game three back in Cleveland. 
Yeah, Joe, I think the biggest thing is he's commanded his fastball down to the bottom part of the zone pretty consistently here tonight. And uh, I think the one thing we like to see is a little bit more off speed. There's a very good hitting fastball club that we're up against, but so far so good with Dice K. Yeah, Terry told us before the game that typically you tell a pitcher just simplify things, but for Dice K, you, you don't want him to be so simple. You want him to use all of his stuff that he brings to the park every time out. Well, we, we do because uh, we feel like his greatest asset can be when he's unpredictable, throwing any pitch at any given count. But uh, the one thing that's he will not do. He'll never give in to a hitter. And, and at times that works uh, as somewhat of a negative because he can run his pitch counts up. But uh, as long as he doesn't get too fine after he gets ahead of hitters, I think we'll be in good shape. You don't worry that much about pitch counts tonight, right, John? No, we don't. We've got a full bullpen. Actually, Beckett is capable of two innings here tonight. So we'll see how this thing goes. John, thanks for your time. Good luck. Thanks, Joe and Tim. It's John Farrell, the pitching coach for Boston. Meanwhile, Travis Hafner is at the plate. 0 for his last 16 with 10 strikeouts. Travis one of the real good power hitters in baseball his home run total just 24 during the regular season but he knocked home 100 went through an 0 for 21 stretch in July after he signed a four year extension then he picked it back up he hit 316 in September at 23 RBIs in 27 games but here in this ALCS he has really been searching for it. Two and one. Victor Martinez on deck. Single tallies in each of the first three innings for Boston. Only one hit, and two strikeouts for Matsuzaka. That's well hit in the air to left field back at the wall. This ball is off the green monster for a one out double. And Travis Hafner trying to get something started here in the fourth inning. That was an inside out swing by a very strong guy. Looked like a cut fastball on the inside part of the plate. A Fenway double for Hafner. First Indian tonight to be in scoring position. Because of that, Veritek goes out and goes over the signs with Matsuzaka. I'd like to correct that. Casey Blake did go to second on that wild pitch. So he was down there in scoring position. So the second in scoring position for Cleveland. And it's Hafner with Victor Martinez at the plate. Victor. Lined out to third his first time up. The Indians, the first six games of this postseason, hit 311 as a group. That carried over from the division series against the Yankees, the first two games of this ALCS. But over their last four games as a team, they're hitting 213. That has hit every part of what is a very well balanced lineup for Eric Wedge. Victor Martinez has been hitting throughout, however, 348 coming in in this ALCS, 350 overall during the postseason. Suzaka knocks it down, has time, and gets Martinez to out. Good play by Matsusaka with the backhand. Ball hit to his right. Watch how quick he is. Ball does not trickle away that far. Martinez is a very slow runner and an easy play for Matsusaka. So now with Hafner at second two out Ryan Garko will be the hitter. The ball was hit hard. Yeah. A long way to go to try to backhand that ball. Nicely done by Matsusaka. Indians tonight trying to get back to the World Series for the first time since 1997. They've won five pennants in the American League. Mark Shapiro, their GM. There's a strike on the outside corner. 
Indians won the pennant in 1920. They defeated Brooklyn in the World Series 1948. They defeated the Boston Braves, but haven't won since. 54, they were swept by the Giants. Willie Mays catch in game one. 95, they lost to Atlanta. And in 1997, heartbreak. Blowing a ninth inning lead and losing in the 11th to the Marlins. Here's an 0 1 to Garko. Strike two. Been a nice pace to this game from Matsuzaka. He is not hurried. He's taken his time and he has been effective, allowing two hits. He struck out two. One thing he rarely does to right handed batters, he doesn't throw the fastball inside with two strikes. So if you're a right hander, lean away. Breaking ball away and it's fouled. By Garko, still 0 2. Ryan has hit in six straight postseason games. With Peralta bats here in the fourth inning, he'll represent the tying run, and he has hit two three run home runs in this series. Something off that pitch, and Garko was out in front, got a piece, still own two. Joe Torre was a marvelous major league player, most valuable player back in 1971. And the first time I heard it was when Joe said it never let a hitter get you out of way with two strikes. Now, does that mean you're vulnerable inside? Of course. But you cannot take the pitch away. Particularly if you're a right handed batter against a right handed pitcher with two strikes. Garko right on top of the plate. Up to get it and fouled it straight back. So if you're a pitcher or you're a catcher, you have the luxury of going farther away because it's no balls and two strikes. Darko bounced out to third his first time up. Darko checked his swing and they do not appeal down to first. That's what Dice K did. He went farther away and Garko held up in time. I think Ryan may see that pitch again. A one out double by Hafner, then Martinez bounced back to Matsuzaka. And Garko able to get a piece. Yeah, that was a mistake. Did you see Veritek move inside? A lot of people think that pitchers pitch it exactly where they want to. Watch Veritek move inside, and the ball sails back over the middle of the plate. He missed by a lot and got away with it. Ninth pitch of this at bat coming from Matsuzaka to Garko, and Ryan Garko could put the Indians right back in this game, down three nothing, top of the fourth. After its second, two out, and a two-two count.
That is shot into center field. Back at the wall. It is off the green monster. The Indians are on the board. It's a two-out RBI double by Ryan Garko, who is now hit in seven straight, and it's a two-run game. Veritek wanted the ball off the plate away. What a battle and a great at bat by Ryan Garko. Watch this ball hang right in the middle of the plate for Garko. Veritek wanted it away. We've said it many, many times. Catchers don't catch those pitches. Garko almost got it out of here. That ball was blistered, and now the tying run at the plate, Johnny Peralta. And a wide strike on one. Peralta checked in at the start of the night, hitting 342 this postseason. He has two home runs in this ALCS. Both are three run shots. That's Josh Beckett. Tying run at the plate, ball one. It was in this type situation where the Indians owned the Yankees pitching staff in the division series. Runner in scoring position, two out. They were 12 for 27. It's been a different story in the ALCS, strike two. Cutter. Cleveland just seven for 26 in this series with two out and a runner in scoring position. Peralta fouls it out of play. Well, he got away with another one there. High breaking ball. Peralta with two three run home runs. And both of them on similar pitches. I, if you're the Red Sox looking from the dugout, John Farrell, you can't like what you're seeing here no. in the last couple of batters. Not this inning. Uh uh. Getting under the breaking ball, leaving it up. Left it up to Garco, left it up to Hafner to begin with. And he got away with one then. Two doubles in the inning, one run, and now a 1 2 to Peralta. <laughs> 2 and 2. Two balls, two strikes, runner at second, and a little squibber. Tough play. Lugo makes the play, and the inning is over. But the Indians are on the board. Two doubles in the inning. One run, two hits. The last one off the bat of Garko to make it three to one, Boston, after three and a half. Bottom three in the order for the Red Sox. Veritek, who has doubled and scored, then Ellsbury, then Lugo uh, against Westbrook. Just had a talk with Eric Wedge, manager of the Indians, and his team is on the board after the two-out RBI double by Ryan Garko. Two and zero. Oh. Veritek homered against Westbrook in game three in Cleveland. And he's up on the count here, three and oh. Give you our Flomax game summary. Manny Ramirez with an RBI single in the first. Ryan Garko has put Cleveland on the board. It's three to one. And Boston, two double plays grounded into tonight and 13 in this series. That's a record. Three and one. On Veritech. Red Sox have had their leadoff runner on in the first three innings, and every time, every inning, they've scored. Full count on Veritech.
Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Ken Rosenthal, Chris Myers, our producer Pete Machesca, our director Bill Webb, Fenway Park Game 7. The winner of this game will host World Series Game 1 on Wednesday night. 3-2 to Veritek. Base hit, he's 2 for 2. We talked to Eric Wedge, the Indians manager, and talked about that big two-out RBI double hit by Ryan Garko to put Cleveland on the board in the last half inning. That was a great at bat. Uh, I mean, he had to foul some pitches off, some tough pitches, and, uh, you know, uh, after soccer, he's, he's, he's throwing the ball well tonight. I mean, he's throwing the ball well, so, uh, you know, we got to work cut out for us, but I feel like we've been putting up some tough ABs. Uh, we just have to make sure it translates for us now. Well, let's talk about your starter, Jake Westbrook. He has been bending a little bit, but hasn't broken. <laughs> he's gotten a couple big double plays. That's exactly right, and, and that's what he does. He puts the ball on the ground, and, uh, you know, we got to do a better job of those first couple of hitters and uh, not creating so much... Uh, you know, damage for ourselves and, uh, and have him having to work that hard. So we're keeping a close eye on him, but hopefully he's going to uh, settle in. Yeah, I see you talking to Carl down there a lot, uh, <laughs> and I'm sure the topic of conversation is how long do we go before we start dipping into our board? Well, you know what? We've got guys down there, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot to ask him when you talk about the third or fourth inning. So hopefully Jake can get back on track and we'll be okay. Eric, thanks for your time tonight and all series long. All right, thank you. All right. Eric Wedge in his fifth season with the Indians, and he has Jensen Lewis up for the second time tonight. The Red Sox have eight hits already against Westbrook, but only three runs. Ellsbury takes high with Casey Blake way in, expecting a bunt. Ellsbury took ball one. You think of the common sense, common baseball sense. You've got a guy who throws strikes, he throws ground balls, you've got a contact hitter at the plate, everything cries out for a hit and run. The Red Sox have the lead, you take more chances with the lead. We'll see if Veritek's running. And a line drive. That's a fair ball. Throw down to second to get the lead man. And Veritek is erased. One on, one out. Very nearly caught the ball for the double play. In fact, Veritek going back to first base. Had Garko caught the ball, perhaps Veritek beats him to the bag. Watch Veritek doesn't break right away. So he's an easy out at second base, but really that was the proper play Jason made then. So the Red Sox, in essence, trade the speed of Veritek at first for the speed of Jacoby Ellsbury, who was a threat to steal. Oh, uh, he'll run sometimes. Pardon me, during this sequence, we'll just choose a pitch and try to choose a breaking ball. Reason for that, a breaking ball is slower. Often it's in the dirt. And you can be able to see a lot of that. Pedroia on deck, Jacoby Ellsbury, 10 for 10 as a big leaguer, regular in postseason stealing bases. Starts and stops, and a strike to Julio Lugo. Westbrook varying his deliveries. We mentioned it the other night. One of the best ways to stop the steal is to make him wait at first base. Mess up their rhythm. The runner has a rhythm just like a pitcher does. There he goes. Lugo with a base hit into right center field, and Ellsbury will end up at third.
Red Sox had the right guy covering in Cabrera. He broke too far to second base. That's what speed does to you. You know if you're Cabrera that you've got to get to the bag quickly because of Ellsbury. And in his haste, he vacated the position, and Lugo found it. Red Sox threaten once again. And once again, as you look at the hit, you wonder how much longer the Indians will go with Jake Westbrook, who's allowed nine hits through three and a third innings. That Cleveland bench is hoping for the third double play ball of the night. But Jensen Lewis is ready for whenever they call on Pedroia takes a strike. The red hot Kevin Euclid on deck. And red hot runners at the corners. Ellsbury with great speed. Lugo led the Red Sox in steals with 33. I think you take advantage of Victor Martinez's arm right here. One ball, one strike on Pedroia. That's the one thing the Red Sox have not done during the whole series is take advantage of Martinez's arm. He threw out 28 percent of the runners. Only 14 percent last year and while he's improved behind the plate he's still not a good throwing catcher. Meanwhile the guy at the plate Dustin Pedroia looks for his first RBI of this ALCS. Strike two. The only strikeout tonight for Westbrook was courtesy of David Ortiz back in the first inning. Struck out only two in game three to Jake Westbrook, but much more effective. Six and two thirds allowed just two runs on seven hits. Pitching into the seventh. He's already allowed nine hits here tonight. Three runs as he works in the fourth. Two and two. Red Sox have won eight of their last ten postseason games here at Fenway. A streak that started with game four of the 2004 ALCS, the beginning of that comeback against the Yankees. The 2 2, Lugo is running and a ground ball to the second baseman. Out, out, and another double play. Westbrook and the Indians get it their third of the night and 14th of this series. Pedroia hit it hard. Lugo ran right into the out. Westbrook gets another double play pumped up. We go to the fifth back after this from your local Fox station. Kenny Lofton the number seven hitter for the Indians will lead off Franklin Gutierrez and Casey Blake will follow Matsuzaka. Working in the fifth, three to one, the Red Sox lead game seven. Lofton 0 for one, takes ball one. The pitching stuff of Dice K. Matsuzaka was much better the first three innings than what he displayed in the fourth. And moments ago, Josh Beckett was up and starting to get loose in the pen for the Red Sox. This is Ramirez watching it go over his head, and Lofton will try and turn it into a double. He is out. Decided he couldn't make the play, got in a good position to throw it, and Kenny Lofton appeared to be safe. That left hand was.
is in before the tag was made. He tagged him high, but the left hand was in. No argument from Lofton. Nonetheless, a fine play by Manny Ramirez. He looked out, but wasn't. Now with one out, a strike into Franklin Gutierrez. Meanwhile, we watch night after night during batting practice during the postseason, and you can see the glove glance off the top of the base and not the hand right of Kenny Lofton. The tag applied by Pedroia. The out call was given. That's up the middle, and Gutierrez is on with a one-out hit. But night after night during batting practice, Manny Ramirez takes fungos off the wall. They hit him fly balls against the green monster. He plays the caroms. And he knows that wall, and it paid off on this ball hit by Kenny Lofton. He did not get too close to it. Now you know Yaz is watching this telecast. Nobody made that play better or played that wall better than Carl Yastrzemski. Manny Ramirez, a Yaz-like play. Appreciated by Dice K. And now it's Okajima getting loose for the Red Sox in their bullpen as the Indians are catching up to Dice K. Last inning in this. Blake, who has a hit, takes a ball. On deck is Grady Sizemore with a full complement in the bullpen for Boston. Depending on what Casey Blake does here, this could be it for Daisuke here in the fifth. Right. <laughs> one ball, one strike in a three to one game. Tying run at the plate. Timlin is also at least getting warm, but it's Okajima who is getting loose and warming up. With thoughts of Grady Sizemore, who is on deck. Strike two on Blake. You know, the interesting thing about that double play that ended the fourth inning for the Red Sox, normally with runners on at first and third, the runner at first will stop when the second baseman catches the ball and get in a rundown. But because Lugo was running on the play, Julio probably thought that he's too close to second base and should go ahead and try to get to second base. And it was really too late to stop and get in a rundown. Big with the runner at third. Right. A one-two pitch. Blake serves one into right. A base hit. The Indians get another hit, their third of this inning. It's first and third, only one out. And we'll see with Sizemore coming up. And Okajima in the bullpen. If the change is coming here, three straight hits. How big was that play by Manny Ramirez now to get Kenny Lofton at second base? Huge. Huge for the first out. Matsuzaka has thrown 74 pitches. And John Farrell, the pitching coach, is out to talk. So far tonight, Sizemore has popped up, struck out, and they are going to leave Matsuzaka in the game. You wonder whether Okajima is ready. I think you have to make the move right now. I do, too. I just don't think you could allow Grady Sizemore to hit against, for the third time, against Matsusaka, a very dangerous ploy by Terry Francona. First and third, one out. Red Sox stick with their starter, Matsuzaka. Grady Sizemore in a key spot takes a strike over the outside corner. <laughs> 0 for 9 with runners in scoring position in the postseason is Sizemore. But he can erase all of that frustration if he can connect here against Matsuzaka. Eric Wedge said when he's at his best, Grady Sizemore can control the game. If there were ever a game to control, it's right now. 
twenty four home runs during the regular season hit two seventy seven. First and third one out. Sizemore fooled out in front of it. Strike two. That was his gyro ball. Again, the screw ball. And Sizemore really looks bad on that. You can see how he releases the ball. It's got that odd movement. Rarely a strike. And way ahead of Sizemore. Only 71 miles per hour. Sizemore digs back in with an 0-2 count. First and third, one out. Ball one. Kojima in the bullpen is good against left handed hitters and right handed hitters. Frank Kona showing faith in Matsuzaka. One two pitch. First and third one out. And that's to the left side. And out of play. Beckett threw a few pitches just got his arm loose before the start of this fifth inning but it's Okajima ready to come in if he's needed. And Matt Suzaka wants a new baseball. Five hits against Matsuzaka in the last inning in the third. Two doubles in the fourth. Hafter and Garko, and then three straight singles to start this fifth inning. But Lofton was out at second, trying to stretch his single to a double thrown out by Ramirez. Sizemore into center field. Tagging is Gutierrez. And it's a one run game. Franklin Gutierrez scores. Sack fly by Grady Sizemore, and that is just his second RBI of this ALCS. It's 3 2. And now has Drupal Cabrera. Tying run at first, two out. That's Blake at first, and Cabrera searching for his first hit since the series returned to Fenway. 0 for 4 last night, 0 for 2 so far tonight. Strike one. Better velocity on that fastball, 0 and 1. Two, three, and four hitters for Boston in the bottom of this fifth. Euclid, Ortiz, and Ramirez. Strike two. Backdoor breaking ball from Matsusaka.
Down the left field line, slicing into the corner foul. Brady Sizemore, who got the sack fly and plated the run to make it a 3-2 game, was kept in the park by Daisuke Matsuzaka. Matsuzaka did not allow the hit there and could maintain the lead through four and a half if he can get Cabrera. Meanwhile, Cabrera is trying to set up Hafner, who doubled his last time up. He's on deck. One on, two out. And a shot down the right field line, hooking into the corner foul. One of these two teams will host World Series game number one on Wednesday night. On the air at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. The Colorado Rockies with their eight day layoff. The one two. Cabrera fights it off. Four inches of snow in the Denver area today. Rockies had to work out inside after playing two days of inter squad. Baseball, it's like going back to high school or college, I guess, for the guys. Entertaining themselves while watching these games at night, wondering who they're going to play. Another one, two. That's Paul, two. And every member of the infield started to walk off. When that pitch was caught by Veritek, but Randy Marsh said ball two instead of strike three. I mean, everybody, particularly Mike Lowell and Julio Lugo. But nope, false start. Back to your positions, fellas. So Cabrera gets at least another pitch. And another foul. So we'll say it again. Here's Dice K facing Cabrera with the left handed hitting Travis Hafner on deck and Hideki Okajima ready in the bullpen. You could make the case that either way, either he gets out of this fifth inning and his night is probably finished, or if he doesn't get Cabrera, you would expect to see Okajima for Hafner. You're right. One on, two out. Cabrera strikes out. Terry Francona did just that. He trusted Dice K. Matsuzaka, who gives up one. The strikeout of Cabrera. The Indians have made it a one-run game into the bottom of the fifth, game seven. Seventh game of this ALCS, bottom of the fifth inning, two, three, and four hitters for Boston. Euclid's first up, he's two for two. Oh. Trying to force his way, well, he's done that, force his way into the conversation for the MVP of this series. If the Red Sox should prevail, first pitch a ball. Okajima still up in the bullpen. 3 2 Boston leading. Because of three double plays turned behind him, Jake Westbrook has been able to hang in this game. Three runs on nine hits. Jake on ever so short a leash right now. Understandably. Good pitch, fooled Euclid, strike two. That was a changeup. Try to break the rhythm of Kevin Euclid, who is locked in. Nobody getting loose for the Indians at the moment. Jensen Lewis has been up twice. That's wide, two and two.
strikeout number two on the night for Westbrook. Westbrook has been helped by three double plays in the first off the bat of J.D. Drew. With a bare hand grab in the middle by Cabrera in the second off the bat of Lugo 6 4 3 and then with Lugo running on a ball hit by Pedroia 4 3 and that has helped Westbrook limit the damage and get around the nine hits and the intentional walk and with one out here's Ortiz ball one. Fourteen double plays in this series. And 20 in this postseason. So many double plays the Red Sox have hit into. And that's a new postseason record. One and one on Ortiz. Kojima continues to throw. I would think he would be the pitcher in the top of the sixth inning, particularly with Travis Hafner leading off for the Indians. Westbrook, the 1 1. He has fooled Ortiz all night. 1 and 2. Made him conscious inside so he can go away. Back in there and foul. That's the shortstop Johnny Peralta on the other side of the bag two out and Manny Ramirez coming to the plate the ALCS on Fox is sponsored by Chevy and American Revolution one of the big highlights for the Red Sox tonight to this point as we play in the fifth is the defensive work and the arm and the throw of Manny Ramirez to get Lofton to start the top of this fifth. He has an RBI single. He has been intentionally walked. Strike one. strike Westbrook has really battled here tonight certainly does not have his best stuff but he has kept his team in it at the moment down by just one here in the fifth inning strike two Westbrook and Victor Martinez starting to mix their pitches up a little more, just like Dice K did in the fifth inning. Change up to get Cabrera, change up to get ahead of Sizemore. Now Westbrook doing similar things. Got him on the outside corner. Westbrook with two strikeouts in the inning, three on the night. He's doing what he can. Who's coming up? The three, four, and five hitters for the Indians in the sixth, down by one. No surprise that Hideki Okajima is in the game here in the sixth inning. Three, four, and five hitters for the Indians who trail by one. Hafner, Victor Martinez, and Garko, the Zantac 
relief pitcher profile for Hideki Okajima. And there's the work done at the bottom by the Boston bullpen. Heartburn, attack it. Zantac. During the regular season, the Red Sox bullpen was number one in the American League. The collective ERA of 3.1. And Okajima, who was an all star in his first year in Boston, was a big part of it. Red Sox started this game with a man, as you see, Mike Timlin, Josh Beckett in the background, a man who cost the Red Sox $103 million. Joe talked about it earlier. Okajima signed a two year deal. For two and a half million dollars. That's about two and a half percent of what they're paying to get Matsusaka. Hafner pops it into left. Ramirez back at the track for out number one. One for three so far tonight for Travis Hafner. Something else that comes into play here, and that is the anchor at the back of the bullpen. The Indians. Have Rafael Betancourt, who has been almost untouchable. He's allowed only one hit in this ALCS. Well, he has worked six and a third innings. And on the other side, Jonathan Papelbon said before the game, I will be ready from the seventh inning on. One out, nobody on. Victor Martinez at the plate. Ball one. If this is your first time seeing Okajima pitch, you're probably saying, what is that violent head jerk toward the third base line when he delivers the pitches? Well, that's part of the reason that he is so effective. I mentioned it the other day that in Japan they tried to actually, no pun intended, but get his head on straight and have him throw. With that head still, but he was ineffective and went back to the way he did it when he got to the Red Sox. And can he ever do it? Here it is one more time. If you haven't seen it, watch. Does that on every pitch. Behind on the count to Victor Martinez, who hit 25 home runs during the regular season. Two and one. On deck is Garko. April 2nd, first pitch that Okajima threw. John Buck of the Royals hit at 410 feet for a home run. Then he went two, like a 20 and two thirds innings without allowing another run. He misses down and away, three and one. Martinez has hit 421 over his last five games against Boston. 0 for 2 tonight. Victor Martinez could tie it with the long ball and he takes a foul. Victor has hit two home runs this postseason. Just got a piece. In the 
air to right. J.D. Drew to his left. Two out. Garko coming up. Tomorrow at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, the new Fox Monday heats up with an all-new episode of Prison Break, followed by an all-new episode of the groundbreaking series Kville begins tomorrow night Monday at 8 Eastern 7 Central only on Fox viewer discretion is advised here tonight Fenway Park a battle for a spot in the World Series. There's the prize. With two out, Garko. Oh. Ball one. Garko doubled home a run his last time up with a double high off the wall in left center field. He had 21 home runs during the regular season. And he has been a much more dangerous hitter as the innings have gone on this postseason. Later in the game, the better Garko has been. The 1 0. In to his left. Lugo stumbles a bit, but gets the out. And Okajima has a perfect first inning of work in the sixth. Lowell, Drew, Veritek coming up for the Red Sox, who lead game seven by one. Go to the bottom of the sixth inning here at Fenway Park. And with Rafael Betancourt getting loose, Westbrook survives into the sixth inning. And Mike Lowell, who has a single, a sack fly, is first up. First pitch a strike. Two. Aaron Laffey, by the way, threw 50 pitches last night, did a wonderful job for the Indians. He is probably not available tonight unless this game goes extra innings. On the outside corner. And that is three strikeouts in the last four outs picked up by Jake Westbrook. Yeah, this resurgence of his fastball and pinpoint control. That was lacking in the early innings. Five in a row now retires by Westbrook. But my thinking, Joe, was, you know, once you retire Mike Lowell, you could bring in a left-hander, but no confidence in Rafael Perez, who in an inning has an earned run average of over 45. So you can't bring him in to pitch to the left-handers, Drew, and, and two hitters, Ellsbury. That is a rocket foul. And when you don't have Rafael Perez available in the late innings, that's a big weapon that the Indians were counting on coming into this series against the left-handed Thunder that the Red Sox can bring at you. Right. Hello. Drew checks his swing and talking to Eric Wedge about Perez, he doesn't really know what's wrong with him. The only thing he can figure out is that maybe he's starting to tire. But he was sensational against the Yankees in the division series has not been so against Boston two and two on Drew <laughs> to the second baseman Cabrera what a job done tonight by Westbrook Two out in the bottom of the sixth inning. The Colorado Rockies won the National League pennant. 22 of their last, 21 of their last 22 games. Matt Holliday, the National League MVP candidate, was the MVP of the NLCS. Tulowitzki, the slick fielding shortstop. Francis won game one of both postseason series. And Todd Helton, finally, in the World Series in his 11th season. World Series game one, Wednesday night here on Fox. At 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, either in Cleveland or here in Boston. Now Veritek is fooled. Well, 
Looks like a different pitcher on the mound. He is dealing. One ball, one strike. Last year, we were in New York at Shea Stadium for the NLCS. It went seven games, and another number 37 was pitching for the Cardinals, Jeff Supon, who got into, out of trouble, much like Westbrook, and then he kept his team in it. So Yadier Molina hit that home run to put the Cardinals in the World Series. Westbrook has been terrific now after struggling the first three innings. Two and two on Veritek. Jason Veritek strikes out. That's four strikeouts. And the last six outs picked up by Westbrook. Still 3 2, seventh inning now. We come back after a break from your local Fox station. It's the seventh inning of game number seven, a one run Red Sox lead. For the Indians, it's Peralta first up. Fooled by Okajima, strike one. Johnny Peralta, Kenny Lofton, Franklin Gutierrez. Peralta tonight, 0 for 2. Who's getting loose? Jonathan Papelbaum, the closer here in the seventh inning for Boston. One ball, one strike. Peralta's grounded out twice. Seven of his 13 hits in this postseason have been for extra bases. He's popped two home runs in this series, both three run shots. The 1 1. Ball two. Field line for Drew on the dirt. One out. Kenny Lofton is coming up. Back in the fifth inning, he led off and hit one off the wall and left. And Manny Ramirez took over from there. Played it perfectly through a strike. It looked like the left hand of Kenny Lofton got on the bag prior to the tag, but out was the call, and then two hits followed. So three straight hits started the fifth. But with that play at second base, it presented the Indians with only one run on a sack fly by Grady Sizemore. Lofton shallow left. Lugo drops it. Lofton ends up at second base, and that's the tying run. Ramirez would have called Lugo off that play. However, Lugo put his right hand out, saying, I've got it. And it looked like it drifted on him and drifted off the webbing. You could see the right hand going up. When that happens, outfielders are warded off. That ball off the webbing. And so now with that error by Lugo, his first of this postseason, he made 19 during the regular season. The tying run is in scoring position for the Indians. And the man that Eric Wedge stuck with and put back in his lineup, Franklin Gutierrez, steps in. 
strike one. It's Gutierrez now. It's Casey Blake on deck, and that may be the chance that the Indians have been waiting for. It's presented because of an error on a pop-up. Off the bat of Lofton and off the glove of Julio Lugo. Spin but no throw by Okajima. Can Franklin Gutierrez deliver for the Indians? Became the regular right fielder during the month of August. One ball, one strike. The Indians making noise again. Let's go down to Chris Myers. Well, Joe, we've had a lot of major shifts of momentum in this series, but this Cleveland dugout, you know, last night in the first few innings of this game, very uneasy, very tense, but since Jake Westbrook has been pitching so well the last three innings here, the look in the eye, the confidence level, I don't know if you can draw offense from the way your pitcher is going, but you're feeling it here. The longer the Indians hang around in this, even if they don't rally to win it or to tie, it won't be because they're short on confidence. Thank you, Chris. One ball, one strike on Gutierrez, who hits one foul. Westbrook has retired eight Red Sox in a row. Looks like he's using his changeup much more beneficially, moving the ball around. Smiles coming easy in the Indian dugout, even though they're still trailing by a run. Gutierrez is able to get a piece. Okajima trying to give the Red Sox two big innings of relief work. He had a perfect sixth. Retired Peralta to start this seventh. Has the error behind him and now has to try and pitch around it. Skinner, it looked like he was waving him home, and Lofton got confused and stopped. Boy, that's a great call by third base umpire Paul Emmel. That ball crossed over the bag and then landed in foul territory. Lofton was held up. Yep, he was held up all the way mm. because Skinner, the third base coach, and you can see that's clearly a fair ball. It went over the bag, landed in foul territory. A good call by Emil. But Joel Skinner, a bit cautious at third base, I think. I would agree, and that's the reaction from Eric Wedge in the dugout. As that base hit by Gutierrez, and Gutierrez has come through for Eric Wedge, makes it first and third for Casey Blake, and does not tie this game. Lofton with his good speed is held at third and now the pitch to Blake to the third baseman Lowell Pedroia double play and the Red Sox keep their lead Cleveland's been turning them all series and the Red Sox get a huge double play to end the top of the seventh. Still 3-2. Bottom of the seventh inning, and it's Jacoby Ellsbury first up against Rafael Betancourt. But the conversation has got to go back to the base hit by Franklin Gutierrez and Lofton, who was on at second after the error by Lugo being held at third. 
as that ball hit off the billboard down the left field line in foul territory kicked back toward the field of play and Ramirez hadn't even picked it up yet and Lofton was held at third the double play ball followed and it's still 3 2 Boston in the seventh I don't think there would have been a play on uh, Kenny Lofton coming home I understand why Joel Skinner the third base coach held him up quickly because you've got to make your mind up immediately because if you don't the left fielder can throw behind the runner if he makes a wide turn but you got to make your mind up in a hurry Joel Skinner elected to hold him immediately and it was the wrong move. That is the life of a third base coach having to make that determination when that ball hit and then kicked back. You're still rolling on the ground as Lofton was getting to and getting beyond third base but was held there. And now Ellsbury fouls it back still one and two. Joe I think initially Skinner was waving Lofton home yeah see that's what I saw he's waving him home you're right and then stops him late right right the, the initial action is waving with the left arm and now he's watching Ramirez and he determines that the play can be made uh, keep in mind if if Lofton is thrown out at home you still have Gutierrez on at second base you don't have a man on third and less than two out but you do have a man in scoring position. Gutierrez would have gone to second on the throw. Ellsbury hits one to third off the glove of Blake, and Jacoby will end up at second base. The minute Casey Blake goes back, allowing the ball to play him, it's a, a very difficult play. You have to determine that hop quickly. And Ellsbury on second with an error and now look for Lugo to bunt. Everybody knows the bunt's coming here. Meanwhile for Julio Lugo who made the error to put Lofton on base in the first place. Nobody more excited to see that double play ball off the bat of Casey Blake to end the top of this seventh. in on the corners of the infield and Lugo pushes one to the first baseman Darko the flip for the out Ellsbury at third one away eleven o'clock in the east and we give you a game summary brought to you by Verizon Matt Suzaka got through five allowed two runs on six hits Westbrook was just relieved after going six innings allowing three earned runs on nine hits but boy was he great his last three innings settled down and gave his team a chance and Pedroia and Euclid at the top of this lineup for Boston they've been all over the bases and here's a chance for Pedroia now to knock home his first run of the ALCS infield is in with the great speed of Jacoby Ellsbury at third even with the infield in they better be perfect. Strike one. Pedroia had first and third in front of him back in the fourth inning and bounced into a 4 3 double play.
Not bad for a guy who describes himself as 5'2", 115 pounds. I was thinking the same thing. Pedroia listed at 5'9", 180, and he goes deep for his first RBIs of this ALCS. And the rookie, his first postseason home run. Euclid is jammed. Two out. Meanwhile, Betancourt had not allowed a run in the postseason. In eight and a third innings coming in. And the rookie they love to pick on in that Red Sox clubhouse, Dustin Pedroia, has just opened up a three-run lead for Boston. Terry Francona and Pedroia play cribbage every day before the game. Francona's description, I wear him out. I beat him every day, and then he goes out and gets two hits. Tonight, he's two for four. Now David Ortiz with two out. Strike one. Ortiz is hitless tonight. The guy who started this was Ellsbury who has one hit earlier and the speed had to play a factor on that ball hit to Casey Blake he backed up on it it ate him up down to second went Ellsbury on the error over to third on the bunt by Lugo and the home run by Pedroia and not only from game to game but obviously minute to minute and inning by inning the momentum continues to switch from one side to the other and now the Red Sox seem to have all of it. Strike two on Ortiz. Skinner made the decision on that ball that hit off the billboard. Remember Ramirez has already thrown out one runner. He threw out Lofton. Ironically enough back in the fifth inning. Ortiz just flips the bat at it. Flies it to Lofton and left. And Kenny Lofton forgot how many outs there were. Ellsbury at third, a rookie. Dustin Pedroia at the plate, a rookie. Two rookies pitching for the Red Sox here in game seven. They lead by three into the eighth. Okajima's first pitch to Grady Sizemore. Trying to bunt. He does bunt for a base hit. And so the Indians come right back, put their leadoff man on here in the eighth inning, down by three as Sizemore bunts his way on. And that could very well be the end of Okajima. Papelbon is ready in the bullpen. A great bunt by Sizemore. Shoveled by Euclid to Pedroia, but too late. The two Japanese imports that the Red Sox brought in, Daisuke Matsuzaka pitched the first five. Okajima pitches the next two, gets into the eighth inning, and with as Drupal Cabrera coming up, we'll see if Francona is going to stay with Okajima or go to Papelbon. Immediately following tonight's telecast, log on to foxsports.com or MLB.com for a live extended postgame webcast. Player interviews, press conferences, highlights, analysis, much more. Chris Myers, Harold Reynolds, Jim Leritz, and Ken Rosenthal. And also join them throughout the World Series an hour and a half before game time for live batting practice. FoxSports.com or MLB.com. Here is Cabrera. And it is a three-run game. And with the left-handed hitting Hafner on deck, Right now, Francona is going to stick with Hideki Okajima. And we have said it in uh, past playoff games, Jonathan Papelbon has never had a six-out save. He's only had one five-out save. Strike one on Okajima. Okajima 
as Cabrera looked at the first pitch for a strike Okajima has had plenty of time off as the Red Sox extend him here in game seven. Hideki did not pitch in game six did not pitch in game five did not pitch in game four line drive base hit into center field and the Indians will have the tying run come to the plate. The rookie as Drupal Cabrera with a base hit up the middle two on nobody out and that's going to be it for Okajima. What a job by the left hander as Papelbon the closer for Boston will enter two on nobody out. Boston up three in the eighth. Papelbon is in the game, but we're going back to that play in the top of the seventh inning with Lofton on at second base. Gutierrez with a base hit down the line. And look where Lofton is when the ball is approached by Manny Ramirez. There is no way that Manny, in my judgment, and Joe evidently in yours that he would even have a, had a play he'd probably go to second base with the ball. Yeah there's no he's not even close to it with Lofton at third but now fast forward to the eighth that was the Indians chance to tie this game in the seventh instead the double play ball followed and now Jonathan Papelbon the closer for Boston who is still looking for his first career save opportunity in the postseason. He gets a save tonight. He will earn it. He needs to get six outs. And he comes into the game facing the tying run in the person of the D.H. Travis Hafner. Who's one for three tonight. Applebond gave up five home runs during the regular season. After now, then Martinez, then Garko. Three home run threats for the Indians. Strike two. Not much mystery as to what's going on the first two pitches of this at bat. Heat against heat. Three straight fastballs to get after. You can see Veritek standing up. When he does that, you know the fastball's coming. So now Victor Martinez, who can really hit. Terry Francona talked about him tonight before the game. Another chance for the Indians. Martinez 0 for 3 tonight. He has two home runs this postseason. In his career, 0 for 1 against Papelbon. Clutch, Lugo can't turn it, and it's first and third, two out. 
First Pedroia, then Lugo, and the inning continues. Neither could get the ball out of the glove. First Pedroia, right there. Now Lugo, right there. Martinez, perhaps the slowest player on either team. That is a double play that should have been turned and wasn't. See if the Indians can take advantage. Now it's Garko. Ryan hit an RBI double high off the wall in deep left center field back in the fourth. He's one for three. 21 home runs during the regular season. Won this postseason. strike when a ball is thrown that hard it's the pitch that's down that's easier to pull but from the waist up from the waist to the letters if he can get the fastball there forget pulling it he may hit it out it's got to be to another part of the field a slider first breaking ball thrown by Papelbon looked like it crossed Veritek up I wonder if Veritek was expecting a fastball looked like it center field well hit Ellsbury to his left inning over bottom of the eighth in game seven Red Sox lead 5-2 the scene here at Fenway Park the Red Sox first started playing in 1912. Manny Ramirez first up in the bottom of the eighth. Boston leading 5-2. Betancourt gave up two runs in the seventh inning. One of them earned the two-run home run off the bat of Dustin Pedroia. He's given Boston the breathing room here in the late innings. Ramirez, after the first pitch, pops it up. Cabrera. One away. And on this night, game seven for Boston as they try and move on to the World Series. Ortiz 0 for 4. Manny Ramirez 1 for 3 with a walk. This lineup has been strong at the top with Pedroia and Euclid again and at the bottom with Veritek two hits Ellsbury a hit reached on an error scored a run. There's Lowell. Strike one. How many games in here at Fenway Park with Red Sox fans talking about the defense of Manny Ramirez. Not many. If any, he plays that wall well here at Fenway, and he showed it yet again as he played it perfectly on the ball hit by Kenny Lofton, leading off in the fifth inning. Lofton thrown out at second. 
by Ramirez and the tag by Pedroia. Two hits followed. Only one run in the inning because of that play. Strike two on Lowell. Jonathan Papelbon is trying to send the Red Sox to their 11th World Series. And trying to ring up his first postseason save. These two teams finished the regular season with identical records of 96 and 66. But because the Red Sox beat Cleveland during the regular season five out of seven games they got the home field advantage and there aren't many advantages in sports like the one the Red Sox have here at Fenway. They won eight of their last ten during the postseason here at home. If you're just joining us, this detail of the game is brought to you by Sharp Aquas. Official HD of Major League Baseball bring the details home. The error by Lugo. Tying run at second. One out. The hit by Gutierrez. Lofton was held at third. There would have been no play on him at the plate. And instead of a 3-3 game, it was still 3-2. Double play followed, and then it... The bottom of the seventh opened up on the two run shot by Pedroia. Here's Drew. Ball one from Betancourt. JD hitless tonight. He's bounced into a double play, fly to left, grounded out. Jensen Lewis has been throwing plenty down in the bullpen, but because Jake Westbrook Brook did such a nice job coming together, getting his stuff together, and in the fourth inning on, really shutting down Boston, Jensen has stayed put out in that bullpen. That's high to Drew, two and one. This is the eighth time the Red Sox and the franchise has been involved in a game seven winner take all situation coming into tonight. Boston in their history three and five. When the last time in this situation in the 2004 ALCS at Yankee Stadium. Complete that comeback down three games to nothing. They were down three games to one in this series to Cleveland. Indians with three big outs left. Peralta, Lofton, and Gutierrez, the scheduled hitters in the ninth. Whoever wins this game, we will be here at Fenway Park for the presentation to the team for winning the American League pennant and to whoever is named the MVP of this ALCS. All of 
a sudden, J.D. Drew is locked in. That's his sixth RBI in the last two games. Five last night. The big grand slam home run. And how things have changed for J.D. Drew here at Fenway Park. Now it's Veritek. Captain of this Red Sox team, two hits, three at bats, a double, a run scored back in the second. The Red Sox got the first three runs of this night. Single runs in the first, second, and third, but then the Indians started to chip away. A run in the fourth, a run in the fifth, which included that play by Manny Ramirez in the left, which was big. And with a chance to tie in the top of the seventh. Often held at third, a double play hit into by Casey Blake, a two run home run in the bottom of the seventh by Pedroia after an error by Blake at third. And another run here in the bottom of the eighth. Drew is running and a bunt is foul. That was odd with one out. Very odd. Jason Veritek. Bunting, a drag bunt with Drew running. I wonder if Veritek missed the hit and run. Possibility. But it's odd with one out. There's no way Veritek's trying to bunt Drew to second base. Drew running on the play didn't look back at Veritek. Often that runner at first will take two or three steps and then look back to see what the hitter's doing. Find the ball. That was a weird play. I have no idea. How's that for crack analysis? That's I have good. no idea. It's okay to admit that. <laughs> Bear attack with a big hole on the right side of the infield. Drew got a great jump when he took off. Up and away, one ball, one strike. The rookie Ellsbury's made a difference. Fans were pleading call in shows and the like with Terry Francona to make the switch. He did for game six. That is Coco Crisp. Different hairstyle for game seven. And Ellsbury's made a difference in this game and made a good catch on that ball hit by Garko on the top of this eighth. He really did. That was not an easy play to end the inning. Marco hit it a long way into right center field right at the Red Sox bullpen and Jacoby Ellsbury ran it down. And on this night when everybody has been available to both managers we've only seen a total of five pitchers. Strike two on Veritek. We thought we could see Sabathia. Beckett got loose a couple of different times. But Westbrook went the first six, struck out five, was very, very good as it turns out. Betancourt out there for his second inning. And on the other side, Dice came at Suzaka is in line for the win. Okajima, two big innings, and Papelbon trying for a six out save. Two pitch to Veritek, one on, one out. Left side, near the line. Peralta and Blake collide. It's a fair ball. 
and it hops out for a ground rule double. It's a Bermuda Triangle down there here in the last couple of innings. Yeah, you wonder if anybody's going to return from that area. That is Peralta's ball. He's got the best angle. Casey Blake going too far down the line. No communication. And a botched ball by the Indians. It'll go as a double, but it should have been caught. Second double of this inning and second double of the night for Veritek. And now with the infield in, here's Ellsbury. Jacoby is going to be intentionally walked. To load him up with one out for Julio Lugo. Intentional walk, second one handed out tonight by Cleveland. Ramirez got one back in the third inning, and Eric Wedge jogs out. With Lugo coming up. Game one of the 2007 World Series, Wednesday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, in high definition here on Fox. story is unbelievable sensational and we have not seen anything like it with the way they have closed down the regular season and played in this postseason here's what they did to Arizona they held them to eight runs and a 148 average with runners in scoring position they trailed in only two of 38 innings first team 76 I mean you start piling it all up and you realize that this is a Colorado team that had a combined ERA of 2.08 in the postseason to Remarkable. this point. Remarkable. Did you ever think that a Rockies team would have a group ERA of just over two. No. It's sensational for Colorado and what a job they have done. Out there with a bases loaded one out that's off the end of the bat Clint Hurdle the manager Bob Apodaca and then you look at what the team has done through September 15th six and a half games out and at the bottom four and a half out of the wild card they fought their way back they got into that one game playoff Thanks in large part to what the Milwaukee Brewers did on that final weekend against San Diego. But then Colorado had a good night swing in the bats against Jake Peavy and won the game coming back in extra innings against Trevor Hoffman in the 13th. And overcoming a two run deficit there. Meanwhile, the Indians playing the infield in with one out and the bases loaded. It's unusual. But the fact that Lugo can run so fast and so well, you're almost forced to do that because if he hits a ground ball to the infield, there's no way to double him up unless he hits it very, very hard. That's why the infield's in. Bases are loaded one out one ball one strike from Betancourt. Lugo defensively made the error on the pop up on the ball hit by Loft and then couldn't turn a double play in the top of this eighth inning. Because of the pitching of Okajima in the seventh and Papelbon in the eighth. It didn't hurt the Red Sox. A 1 1. 
Good fastball from Betancourt, strike two. Boston has added a run here in the eighth, lead by four. Their biggest lead of the night. A chance for more. One two pitch to Lugo. Back toward us. Meanwhile, if Boston ends up winning this ALCS and they take on Colorado the Rockies won two out of three games from Boston here at Fenway in June and during that three game set the Rockies outscored the Red Sox 20 to 5. One two Lugo strikes out two away and within that series Josh Beckett allowed six runs against Colorado his high for the year Boston has not had to use him yet Cleveland did not play Colorado and a big hand for a little man and he deserves it. With a leadoff hit and a run scored in the first. And a big two run home run in the seventh. Off Betancourt. Bases loaded, two out. And a shot into left center field. Could empty the bases. It will empty the bases. Dustin Pedroia with a huge game seven. had the night of his life with a two run home run in the seventh and a three run double in the eighth three hits overall tonight two more for Euclid two out Pedroia at second one ball one strike
Kevin Euclid, red hot. He and Pedroia have singled, doubled, and homered in this game. How about the Red Sox outscoring Cleveland 30 to 5 in the last three games? tonight scoring for Boston and only one hit and one RBI between David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez. Somebody will pick up uh, the box score of this game in 50 years and say ah oh, what a blowout but this game was so close for so long for six and a half innings and then the Red Sox blew it open. Last night Boston scored 12 and Ramirez had one RBI on a sack fly and Ortiz did not drive home a run so it's been other names and the top two guys Pedroia and Euclid a lethal combination in the last two games Ortiz strikes out but the Boston Red Sox are three outs away from riding to their 11th World Series. Papelbon back to the hill. 11-2 in Game 7. Defensive change for Boston. As we go to the ninth inning, Ellsbury moves from center to left. Coco Crisp is now in the game in center. Ramirez is out. 11 to 2, and Papelbon fires a fastball past the bat of Johnny Peralta. Matsuzaka, five innings, two runs, six hits. Okajima, two plus innings, no runs, three hits, and Papelbon took care of the eighth. He's 0 2 on Peralta to start the night. since the sixth inning of game four they've scored five runs in 29 innings and they've been outscored 30 to five in the last three games Peralta floats a base hit into left field and the Indians put their leadoff man on here tonight. Kenny Lofton will be the hitter. Kenny Lofton has a hit tonight. Also reached on an error. 17th year in the big leagues. 97 career postseason hits, 11th time in the postseason, and still searching for his first ring. And he has been so, so close. Into left, Ellsbury with a diving catch. <laughs> 2002. Eight outs away with the San Francisco Giants. The Angels won the World Series. Ninth, or 2003 with Chicago. Game five, five outs away from getting to the World Series. The Chicago Cubs lost. And then, of course, with the New York Yankees in 2004. The Yankees up three games to nothing over the Red Sox. And it was the Red Sox who went to the World Series. 
Ortiz is ready for the celebration. One on, one out. Hey, strike right. one. Red Sox did not have to use Beckett tonight. So they'll have him lined up for game one on Wednesday night. Gutierrez into right center field. Crisp is there. Two out. Boston Red Sox won five of the first 15 World Series in 03, 1912, 1915, 1916, and 1918. In the 86 year layoff, they win it in 2004, and Terry Francona is about to take the Red Sox to their second World Series in his four years as manager here. Blake into right center field. Chris back to his left, still going, and the Red Sox win the pennant.